So thank you very much. It's a great honor uh, to be invited to give the Dewey Lecture. And as well, thank you for the warm introduction. Um, since, since the uh, integration of the concept of human dignity into the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, human dignity has become a, a major concept in, in legal constitutional thought. Uh, and there are very interesting questions. I mean, uh, uh, is human dignity the, the source of all rights, the way it's in the German constitution, is a sort of the preamble for all rights? Uh, since humans have dignity, therefore they are entitled to rights, etc. Is it, is it a, is, does it designate a domain which is actually outside uh, uh, the particular realm of all human rights? Is designate a particular right into itself? For example, in the Geneva Protocol, the, the use of human dignity is particularly directed to uh, against um, uh, degrading. Um, prisoners of war and others, um, et cetera. So, so uh, there, there's a quite complex discussion in the literature about the particular legal use of, the, of human dignity in, in legal material. By the way, in the Israeli case, since uh, there isn't a, a kind of a robust um, uh, bill of rights, the, the, the mention of, of, the, of human dignity becomes a, a vehicle in which the Supreme Court has, has been pushed and uh, has been integrated uh, uh, rights into the legal system. So uh, it's very complex, very question actually, what is exactly the, the force of that use? There are great work. Uh, there is actually a very a, a great article by Naomi Rao that, that has the title of my lecture, Three Concepts of, of, of Dignity, that does a, a, a fantastic work in analyzing how the concept works in different legal traditions. Uh, there's also a, a wonderful work by Christopher McRudden on, on this subject. I'm not going to deal with the uh, legal realm. I hope that, that my, my analysis will, will, will help to shed light, but this would not be the focus of my lecture. Now, when we move to uh, philosophy again, there, there's a, an intense, actually, contemporary revitalized interest in the subject. We have a at, um, Jeremy Waldron in his um, Tanner lectures talking about human dignity as, a, as an issue of status, a rank uh, against Kant. It's not about values, it's about uplifting everybody to, to elevating everybody to the rank of nobility. There's a very interesting book by Michael Rosen that does the analytic work of, of the history of the concept and its uses. Martha's work also has a, a lot with human dignity in relationship to capabilities with, a, with an interesting uh, critique of Kant uh, uh, claiming that actually the source of human dignity does not lie in our capacity for kind of detached rational thinking. It's more interrelated to our animal being. Thus, Martha wants to extend the concept of dignity to other species. So, so there is a lot of it's a saturated field, so why am I entering that? Uh, I'm entering it with the hope of contributing something to, to the issue. Um, and I want to take another angle at the, at the, at the topic, which is um, to analyze the meaning of human dignity, this concept, through ways in which human dignity is actually violated. And that will be uh, my aim. What, do we have a good phenomenology uh, uh, of doing that, some, some of, some of uh, um, um, a, a, a subtle account of, of violating human dignity. Now, before I get to the, what I would call three ways in which human dignity is violated, I want to start with a particular observation that has to do actually with the Hebrew language. Uh, we have different root metaphors to talk about dignity. A lot of them come from issues of height and elevation, rank, status. We also have a metaphor that comes from the world of exchange, value for Kant, so sort of absolute value. It's, it comes from the commerce, from the marketplace. If you look at the, at the Hebraic root of dignity, kavod, it comes from the term kaved, which means weight. By the way, here is the connection to the Latin gravitas, gravity. Someone who has dignity is related to gravity, gravitas, etc. Uh, uh, and uh, 
And I want to actually, among the different root metaphors of, of the ways in which we construe that, that very complex category of human dignity, I want to focus on the issue of weight. Uh, by the way, in the Hebrew, disrespecting someone or abusing him, etc., le kalel, to curse, comes from kal, make him light. And, and by the way, in our contemporary language, uh, we, we carry that, though weight is a difficult problem for modern people. Uh, 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 we carry that someone being a lightweight. And you look at the synonymous of, synonyms of, of lightweight, someone who... Who's, uh, who, has, uh, who has no, someone with no significance, someone who doesn't count, a non-entity, a nobody. Uh, uh, so I'm, uh, what I w my, my comments will be really about the following issue. How do you empty someone of his weight or her weight? So, so how do you deplete the gravity, gravitas, kavod, kaved of a person? That will be the organizing uh, uh, way in which I look at the subject of dignity. Now, I just want to, before entering my phenomenology, my more detailed phenomenology of how dignity is violated, I, I want to mention one thing, one sort of tension that is in the, in the philosophical the tradition or in discussion on dignity, which is the following. Dignity is used to uh, uh, describe and, and, and uh, we, we relate to dignity in terms of preservation of rights, autonomy, etc. It's a status term. When we want the quality of, of human dignity by that, we want everybody to, to have that status. But in our language, dignity also is a way of behaving in the world. Someone behaved dignified. Right? So there's a, a dignified behavior. There's a beautiful book by Schiller it's about dignity and grace where he talks about what does it mean to behave dignified, this idea. And philosophers trying to figure out where is the duality here. It's actually quite complex, right? So when we say that someone behaved in a dignified fashion, we mean that he wasn't swayed, he, 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 he didn't betray his ideals under pressure. Uh, 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 there was a carrying of his suffering uh, uh, in a way that he wasn't crushed. And by the way, What's interesting about the weight metaphor, it, there is a connection here, right? The, the, the way in which you behave in a dignified manner is that you, you stand on your gravity. You, weren't, you didn't betray your ideas under pressure. You, 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 were, you were acting in, in a mode in which you stood your ground. There is a kind of a... You weren't swayed. There is an element of weight, both in dignity and in acting in dignified way. Okay, so this is by this is a, more of an, an introduction to my take on the subject, and I hope it will help somehow to clarify or help shed a particular light on the topic. So we want to know what, how how do you make someone a lightweight? How do you deprive him of his gravitas. The first thing that comes to mind clearly is, uh, is uh, humiliation and degradation. And when you think about humiliation, what it is to humiliate someone, it's not particularly attached to rights. This is a very important thing for me. You can, by the way, it's not a, an either sufficient or necessary condition that rights infringement is connected particularly to humiliation, right? In sports, this is a trivial example, but it's not, by the way, quite common. In sports, when one team wants to humiliate the other team, so uh, in soccer, this is not, maybe not an American uh, thing, but at least in, in our world, right? So a soccer player wants to humiliate the other team. He dribbles in between his legs, but not to the direction of the goal. Right. So, so just to show that he's helpless. You can do it in basketball, etc. Uh, and the idea, no right was actually infringed in that action. But there was something very powerful here in which that to humiliate someone is actually to either make him, make him feel or putting him in a status of, in a state of helplessness. This is a very uh, um, powerful aspect of humiliation. Again, uh, uh, you know, sometimes um, this is experience we have in, 
in queues for, you know, we go to, I remember you go to immigration offices and, and there are many people waiting. Your passports are all taken. There are no numbers. Your name is called arbitrarily. There you are, helpless, waiting for your turn. You don't know when it will become, when it's not. By the way, it's not clear whether we can actually detail in a Bill of Rights a right that was infringed, but you were made to feel helpless. Now, when, uh, when we think, and here in the connection of humiliation and helplessness, uh, um, a certain interesting relationship between shaming and humiliating, which I think can get us deeper into this idea of of emptying someone of his gravity, agency, weight. Uh, when someone is shamed, uh, put to shame, uh, one very basic feature that happens there is that he loses his control over his own representation. He doesn't have the power to represent himself to the world the way he or she wish to represent themselves to the world, right? You, it could be trivial again, you might, you might it, it doesn't have to involve anything wrong that you have done, but something you don't want to show to the world, right? You sing loudly in the shower and you realize that the whole neighborhood is listening. Um, 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 a photo of you is, is there in the internet that you didn't wish it to be there. It's not your best, maybe it's your worst, etc. There is a, a sense in which you don't control. I think a feeling shame uh, experiencing shame is a, is a sense in which you lose your basic control of your own represent, presentation to the world. It's, it's, it's so deeply connected to being a self because a self or a human is the human that appears, that, that dresses, that appears, that has some control on its appearance. This is why humiliation uh, uh, is so much related in so many practices of humiliation, heartbreaking practices of humiliation, on control of, ongoing control of your self-representation, taking away from you the very basic agency of appearing to the world the way you wish to appear. It has to do with shaving, with nudity. I remember the, the way in which uh, when Saddam Hussein was captured in the front of the TV, there was that, that scene in which his, his, uh, his beard, his tooth, his uh, kind of a shaming representation of a leader as, as a form of humiliation. Uh, uh, there is a, uh, there, and then there are practices in, in different prisons, in, in different, the Abu Ghraib uh, event in which, which um, um, a complete control of, of, of the representation of, 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 of the prisoners by, by by nakedness, that so uh, aims at degrading and humiliating. Uh, so uh, uh, we know this, and, and, and that's where, where, where there is a deep connection between shaming and humiliating and helplessness. If we go deeper into the, into the conditions of, of uh, uh, helplessness and humiliation, degradation, uh, uh, different ways of treating if we, if we look at the accounts of Primo Levi, Jeanne Marie, the great writers of, of the experience of concentration camps or the Holocaust, and, and uh, what you have there is an is a ongoing starvation um, tactics, uh, inmates that are prisoners or human beings that are kept in starvation situation, in which they are degraded to the level of pure maintenance, uh, the hunger, uh, and that, that makes them betray their capacity to be dignified. That, that makes them many times it's very difficult to self-transcend in those moments. You'll find yourself stealing your own children's food, uh, taking away from your, your friend. Uh, degrading in that fall is making you helpless in the way that there is no way you'll be <coughs> dignified in, in those moments. Um, um, there is... A, I think one of the, apropos Jewish law and responsa that I read, one of the most moving responsa that I read uh, from Second World War, rabbis were writing responsa in, in, in ghettos, in, in, in the camps. And, wh and, and rabbi, one rabbi was asked by, by, by a devout 
uh, a Jew whether he should whether he should eat in in Yom Kippur in the day of fast or not. Well, you you can go deal with it legally. You can say, uh, well. Um, You might say there is a, you are exempt because you are under duress because life has to take over uh, or life has, saving life as a priority. But the rabbi says something very deep that, that makes a deep connection between dignity and law. He says to him, and I've never read in the history of Jewish law such a statement. Maybe I never heard in the history of law such a statement. He says, you are outside the law. The, law, the Torah is given to human beings. We are not human beings here. It's a, we are outside the frame of the law, being, being degraded into pure instinctual maintenance. Um, I just want to say one other thing about, interesting thing about this, making someone into a nobody or someone of no significance and have to do with humiliation and degradation, and it's connected to shame. One way of, in which you see Sometimes superiors deal with their subordinates in a, in a humiliating fashion. The, uh, the, um, a, a superior, a boss, will do something very intimate in front of a, of a subordinate, not because they have a particular intimate relationship, but because the eye of that person doesn't matter. Uh, he's a mere piece of furniture in the room. That's a way of kind of evaporating him. His eye doesn't have the power of, of making you self-conscious of yourself. Uh, so one, if I, if I begin with the sort of phenomenology of, of violating dignity, we will start with humiliation and degradation. That's the first aspect. I want to speak about the second thing that became very mainstream because of Kant. Uh, of, of uh, violating someone's dignity. And it has to do with uh, uh, treating him merely as an instrument. It's a, it's, it's a Kantian concept, very important. And when you look at it, it has actually two very diff different meaning, uh, very powerful. The second is a little bit more important for me. Uh, the first one is uh, um, in treating someone as a mere instrument, when you, when you ask yourself, and some readers of Kant says, well, we treat all the time people as mere instruments in the marketplace. We, we do exchanges. We, you are an instrument for my profit. I'm an instrument for your profit. There is, a, there is a kind of shared interest, shared idea of using one another. All of capitalism is about instrumentalizing one another, etc. So uh, uh, what's the big deal? Then you say, well, what will Kant will say, in, in paying you, in paying you, I don't treat you merely as an instrument. How do I know? Because if I would have paid you only, only to make sure that we will have a next deal or, or others will deal with me, then if I could have deceived you, I would have. I, that, that will be purely instrumentalizing you. So what is it not to instrumentalize someone? Is actually to have towards that someone what Kant will say, categorical obligations, unconditional. It's not, I don't pay you because I want some profit in our next exchange. So if I'll ask myself, what does it mean to bestow on someone dignity or to give someone weights, is to see that other person as a source of obligation, as a moral subject. Right? This, is, this is where actually the category of dignity and rights begin to be more attuned, more related to one another. So say, to have dignity or to have mass is to put, uh, 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 to put a restriction before you. Not because I can avenge, not because I can draw profit from you, but because I, I, uh, I, I, uh, I can, uh, um, uh, because I'm a moral subject per se. The other sense of, of this instrumentalization uh, idea of dignity is related to um, you being exchangeable. That's a, it's an interesting thought that Kant develops. It. So you, the idea is um, to say that someone has absolute dignity or for Kant absolute value means that he is not exchangeable. 
right? Uh, uh, there is no trade-off here with him, about him. One thing, it's, it's very interesting, it comes with, again, in my, in my um, recollections from different moments in Jewish law, uh, a lot of discussion, I think, is not only particular to the Jewish tradition, it's the dignity of the dead. Philosophers have trouble with that. After all, the dead doesn't feel anything. Why do we have obligations towards the dead, etc.? cetera? Uh, but here, actually, it captures something deeply Kantian. And I want to talk about this issue of being exchangeable. An interesting law, the ritual practices in different traditions uh, 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 of mourning. And in Jewish law, there is, uh, um, you sit for seven days, the shiva, it's, it's considered a therapeutic, very powerful, cathartic moment of mourning. Community comes to comfort you, etc. There is one law which I think is more the most interesting legal moment in laws of mourning, which is that if there is someone who doesn't have mourners, nobody is there to mourn for him. The community has to appoint 10 people to sit in mourning for him and other people will come to comfort them. By the way, this is a law that Maimonides legislates and following a Talmudic passage and became part of the legal world of mourning. And you say, what is the idea here? The sort of the dignity of the dead. Uh, the idea is the, the absolute revulsion of a moment in which someone disappears and it's not noticed. Right? Death that doesn't leave a mark as a, as a shock, as a scandal. Uh, from the point of view of dignity of humanity. Right? So th there is a, 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 a certain idea, it's, it's a very powerful concept, in which the community as such has to mark the fact that someone is missing, someone is no more there. Uh, and this is, has to be the idea of ex uh, being exchangeable in a, in, a, in a purely instrumental world. Right? You, you, you gun, then someone, someone else takes your place. Right? And, and, and then the fact that you're missing is not noticed. And, and there is an obligation on, on the community uh, uh, to, uh, this is more related to the dignity of the living, not only the dead, right? To our relationship to others in our community is the fact that we are not going to tolerate a, a disappearance, a death that didn't leave any mark. I want to talk, there's a sort of my last, uh, my last uh, um, reflection on uh, the issue of human dignity. This is kind of an anti-Kantian uh, thing in terms of the question, how is, how is human dignity violated? How is weight being deprived of a person? So Kant says, uh, making someone an instrument, purely an instrument, this is a violation of dignity. There are forms of actually violations of dignity in which someone is not recognized even as an instrument, is of no use. You talk about the conditions of the elderly in, in modern, very modern communities, right? They're, they're of no use anymore. The disabled, prisoners actually, prisoners are cast into a, a position of of just being in the receiving end. They have nothing to contribute. I would say, if I, if I ask you myself, what is then a violation of dignity is actually making someone superfluous. Superfluous of no, he has nothing, or he or she has nothing to contribute, to give. Uh, and, and, and this is a powerful way, by the way, it's a twist on the, on the Kantian perception, sometimes actually not being an instrument is a, is a way of making, making you superfluous, um, have nothing to contribute anymore. And this is a societal concern. Again, can we, can we map it onto a particular right? I mean, clearly it is unemployment and other things, but it's not mapped exactly on a particular set of rights. It's, it's a general sensibility. And I, I would say the ultimate, in that, in that world of, of becoming superfluous, the ultimate violation of dignity is the rejection of the gift. And I, I want to uh, reflect a little bit on that, this idea of the, big, uh, the gift being rejected. 
from the point of view of parents, now I'm talking about my own deepest fear as a father, you say, well, would the children reciprocate? It's not clear. By the way, you don't mind that much to be their credit card. It's fine. The ultimate rejection will be a moment in which they will come and say, we don't need your gifts anymore. It's just the denial of gifts. All those, all those letters that you send that are even not opened, all those, um, all those, uh, you know, all those rack gifts that are just piling there without being open, so becoming superfluous. Um, the first rejection of the gift, right, that we know in, in the Jewish tradition, the first rejection of the gift, the story of Cain and Hevel, Cain and Hebel, right, where they're both giving offering, mincha, they, they're both bringing an offering to God. God rejects the gift of Cain. Right. And there is something very interesting that's happening there. Because that rejection is also the origin of violence. Right. It's, the, it's the story of the first murder. Right. Cain then comes and kills, his, murders his brother. The murder of the brother. Uh, that has to do with rejecting of the gift. And why is it... Uh, uh, by the way, apropos, apropos the concept of sacrifice or gift, the concept of the offering, the best, the best translation in English to korban, mincha, to those terms in Hebrew, is not sacrifice, it's offering. What's the difference between an offering and a gift? A gift is someone I give from my hand to your hand. You're under some so-called obligation to receive and reciprocate. An offering is something I put before you, usually uh, a subordinate to a superior, a mincha, I bring, I lay down before you, I, I bring before you, and there is always the possibility of rejection. This is why um, uh, the act of offering in, in the religious world is under the threat of rejection in its first instantiation. Right? Now, the rejection of the gift is... Uh, 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 that moment in which uh, the offering doesn't pass is both the origin of violence and the origin of ritual. Right? Because ritual, ritual is a, is a protocol, is a, is a safe protocol that the gift is transferred from the giver to the receiver. So we have, uh, um, and here I, if I'll, I'll ask uh, myself, a very common yet untranslatable in, in our kind of purely le legal language of violating human dignity is, the, is making someone superfluous, just sort of rejecting his capacity to give. And you enter a classroom, here we are in Dewey's world, so we can talk about education freely and not be embarrassed as philosophers talking about education. You know in the class, the one who will make the most trouble in the class is the one who feels he has, he has nothing to offer, he has nothing to contribute. And, and, uh, and, the, uh, and violence, if you ask about the roots of violence, and, and that's connected to the whole structure of dignity, I think that the roots of violence, violence is a perverse form of restoring weight of making an impact when the impact is denied. And this is why uh, it's so deep, and it's not an accident in, in, the, in the biblical tradition. That in the biblical tradition, the origin of violence is at the, at the moment of the denial of the gift. It's a restoring, and this is true about all forms of, of, uh, of all the three forms I talked about uh, in terms of, uh, of human dignity. The, 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 the violation of human dignity, if we pursue the, the metaphor of weight rather than the metaphor of rank and height, uh, uh, the violation of human dignity causes so many times uh, an attempt to restore weight and impact through violence. 
So what did I do? I mean, these are a set of reflections. I'm entering, as I said, I'm entering a, a, a complex, well-saturated field of, of discussion. Um, um, about human dignity, both in terms of the legal tradition and philosophical tradition. But I wanted to offer some thoughts, uh, trying to analyze the concept from the ways in which dignity is violated, one, starting from the violation. And second, putting some emphasis on the gravitas, kavod, weight category. Right. And if I look at those three ways in which uh, weight is deprived from someone, uh, uh, where, where, where dignity is violated, sort of the humiliating, instrumentalizing, and making someone superfluous, uh, as, as, a, as a kind of an initial phenomenology uh, uh, of, of the category of dignity. And I ask myself, what is exactly their relationship to our language of rights and autonomy and the ways in which the legal, legal traditions really, or some philosophical traditions, there's actually a very interesting book by Keita, George Keita, on, on the issue of human dignity as well. I, I, I would say the following. I, I, I would say, yes, there is a way in which the category of the concept of human dignity relates to the issue of rights and autonomy. By the way, uh, uh, one way of, of making someone helpless is not allowing that someone to decide for himself or herself. So it's a paternalistic mode of, of creating helplessness. Uh, but but uh, or, or you can say rights. I mean, as I say, I can, I can steal someone's car. Someone can steal someone's car and infringe of any property rights without actually uh, violating the dignity of the owner of that car. But when he dangles the key before him, just before he ignites the engine, that's already uh, violating the dignity of the owner because it, it, it's actually sh making something that has nothing to do with actually wanting to have the car, but wanting to frame him, to put him in condition of helplessness. So I, I would say that there is an indirect connection between the categories of rights and autonomy and, and maybe uh, uh, other categories. But I think what's interesting, and I, I say it because there is a, a philosophical line among those who are reading the rich, rich material on dignity to despair from the concept. They say, well, Schopenhauer was the first one, I think, among others, to say this is an empty, mushy kind of kitschy concept anyhow, let's leave it away. Uh, uh, and other, other theories, I think actually it has, it has an immense role because it captures a whole realm of, of a, um, um, interaction, human basic mode of interaction. Not completely fully uh, um, um, reduced to the system of rights and, 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 and autonomy structures. I, my colleague, the, the one, Avishai Margalit, whom I wrote uh, the book of idolatry, my teacher as well, in his, in his book, Decent Society, he says, well, what is a decent society, right? He says, a society that doesn't humiliate his, its citizens or, or those people whom it's control. And, uh, and, uh, and again, uh, this could be uh, legalized, but it could be the, in the manual of the civil servants who, in the way they do cues or other things, it's not fully captured. It's a rich category that, uh, that has its wings far beyond our, our Bill of Rights and other categories, but it's, it's rich in the sense that it, has, it, has, uh, it, it articulates all that sphere of human interaction in which, the way I wanted to put it, in which the gravitas of someone, the weight of someone, is, is being deprived, is becoming, is made into a lightweight, a nobody, someone who doesn't count, someone of no significance. So, uh, uh, and there is a lot of work, human work, political work to do, which is not fully captured by the law, though could, to a certain degree, inspire some legal work. So I, I, I want to thank you for, 
for listening to that and hope that entering this field through that prism, I shed some light on the, on the problem and the question and concept of human dignity. So thank you very much. That, thank you very much. That, that's very rich. And um, I, I think I will start off with a question because we, we now have about, I would say, about 30 minutes, 40 minutes for questions. And then we'll have a reception outside when you can talk to Professor Halbertal more informally. I guess I want to press you on the, the more skeptical okay. side. OK, I guess it comes from the fact, which is a very American fact, that we constantly in bioethics have heard appeal to this concept as though it has some crystal clear unitary meaning and it can serve as a debate stopper because, you know, particularly with religious traditions in play, they'll just say, oh, well, it seems to me that this, whatever it is, whether it's ending the life of somebody who's in a permanent vegetative right. condition right. or whether it's abortion or whether it's human cloning, this violates human dignity. I'm not going to tell you what it is. We all know what it is. And right. then the debate stops. Now, what you, I think it, you've already shown that it's actually much more complicated than that, right. and right. that it's a network rather than a single unitary meaning. But I want to press you on where, okay. where does that go? I mean, okay. does that mean that you shouldn't appeal to it politically and legally unless you're prepared to say more, much more concretely yeah. what particular part of this network am I talking about and why? Right, right. So, so let's, uh, so thanks for the question. This is a really uh, difficult and wonderful question. So let's take the issue of end of life, right, where the dignity is thrown into that discussion. It's actually thrown by both sides. Sure. Yeah. So you say, well, part of respecting someone's dignity means respecting his, his or her autonomy to decide when life ought to end. And needless to say that in our our modern condition, <laughs> uh, our, our medical capacity to prolong life sometimes puts the, the patient and person in a degrading yeah. situation okay. of yeah. pain, degradation, etc., loss of control and everything. So, so you appeal to autonomy and say, if you want to respect that person, give that person the autonomy to decide to end his or her life. That's it. Then comes uh, then comes a, a kind of a, an attack from the religious uh, uh, traditions, right? Where you say, uh, uh, well, um, that means that human life is being degraded because its value is dependent upon you wanting it, right? As if the source of the value of life is the fact that you desire it. And, and life as such, right, is the condition of having desire. So. Well, I'm, I'm not saying not to use it, but here we come to, uh, it's a contest, contested, uh, what we will call an interpretive category, a rich one. Here we will come to another subject which actually I didn't touch upon. Uh, because I was so geared at giving a proper phenomenology. We have to ask ourselves, what is actually the source? What is what is actually the source in us as humans that gives us the claim for weight, gravitas, respect, and all that? And here you will see a completely different takes on this issue. Yeah. Right? Now, I would say, if someone will ask me, differentiate religious ethical sensibility from secular ethical sensibility, it will be about self-ownership. So sort of the religious sensibility, which is, uh, uh, which say, well, the, the life is a gift that you don't own, it's given. Uh, harming yourself is like harming anybody else. You're not entitled to harm yourself. It's actually a rejection of the gift, right? Uh, and uh, so one thing we'll have to figure out, this is not, doesn't make the category useless. But, uh, but a very different, very different, uh, in some ways, incommensurable clash mm -hmm. about uh, the source of human evidence. You would say, because from a secular perspective, and here I'm, I'm, I'm being very careful, 
uh, from a secular perspective, the source of dignity, or I would say the manifestation of dignity, has to do with self-ownership. You own yourself in a, in a deep way. Uh, um, the one that breaks, the, the philosopher that broke that for me, in terms of the spectrum of philosophers, uh, given John Rawls, who denied self-ownership in, yeah, yeah. in a very complex yeah. way. This is, this is kind of the religious undertone in his work. Right? It's kind of the, the denial of self-ownership that, that comes closely to a, a almost theological conceptions of the self and its worth. So what, this was a very long answer. Uh, uh, but that's good. Uh, all all that's that is to say the following. All that's yeah. to say the following. Actually, what's interesting in using the category of dignity in that debate, which is used by both sides, that it helped us go deeper into, the, into our very conception of value of human life, per se, right? and its source. Right? And then it... And then religious traditions, I, I would say Islamic, Christian, Jewish, they will all coalesce on the, on the idea that life is a gift, that you're a custodian, that, that you cannot harm yourself the way you can harm, in the same way you are not, cannot harm others, etc., mm -hmm. uh, etc. Et so it's not being a contested category doesn't make it useless. Actually, in this case, actually help us deepen maybe something for another lecture. This is not a way of fishing for an invitation. <laughs> but but, but, uh, but, but another, another, another take yeah. on the problem of where do actually we find the, the, that source of human dignity in us? Yeah. Yes. Other questions? Brian. I want to ask you about the, the very last bit of the phenomenology, right. the, the category of the uselessness. Right. Um, Super. And, and in particular, the gift. Yeah. Because that was the one that didn't Okay. Explain what the others did. Um, and it, it's not that being treated, being made to feel useless, is indeed seen aptly described as the pride of some other dignity. It was your claim that the gift being rejected would actually have that character. And in particular, I'm thinking of the example you started with, right, which is the kids don't want the money anymore. Right. <laughs> and, now maybe this is just a weird American thing, but I think yeah. there's another side to that, be. which is right. In some sense, it's it's part of their independence and dignity to not need that from the parents anymore, and right. in no way reflects that right. on on me qua parent that they no longer want right. those gifts. Right. right. Um, so I'm wondering why you chose that Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about my, my experiences as parenting and gift giving, <laughs> which, is, which is touchy. So, uh, so what is a good gift that you bring, right? If you come to, you're invited to a dinner, you say, well, I want to give a gift, I'm invited. And you bring the cash worth of the value of that dinner. <laughs> Maybe with a tip. <laughs> that, that will be an insult, right? That will make actually a situation as an exchange. So a good gift is a gift that you know the other person would not buy, right? But he would love to have, right? Uh, and that takes love, love in the sense of attention. I mean, a good gift giver is attentive to exactly this sphere. I mean, we, we, we symbolize it in, in the larger gift world in, in, in ways in which uh, we bring exotic stuff, you know, better. You're not going to bring a bunch of potatoes with you to the dinner has to be an ananas, an exotic tr uh, fruit, <laughs> uh, a, a wine that is, I don't know, etc. cetera. Uh, so I'm, I'm talking about this type of gifts, right? Let's say, you know, who needs your wine here? Or your ananas <laughs> or whatever. Or that particular bicycle that I always dreamt having and I would never dare buy. The way in which you spoil that person. Now, I just want to say one thing, because we are into, into the exchange gift stuff, right? So uh, 
I, I think I think you want gifts to be not the reason. You want, what 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 distinguishes a gift from just mere exchange? I mean, you need I give you, right? So call me whenever you have an overdraft in the bank. I'll be there, etc. And one day you don't have an overdraft, and then like a good grown-up, you say no need for your own, etc. No. So we we're talking about the different structure. So you want to have a, a, a gift exchange, which is not the reason for the relationship, but it's an expression of the relationship. Right? I once had a friend who, who fell in love with his psychoanalyst, you know, badly in love. And I am not being part of the analytical drama. I told him, look, I, I saw that he's getting obsessed. I said, you know that she sees you because you pay her. So he says to me, so I, not only that I love her, I also support her. <laughs> so, I, so I said, no, 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 you, you got it wrong. Your, your support is not part of the relationship. It's the reason for the relationship. Now, so, so uh, the issue is the following, right? The issue is I'm talking about the rejection of debt, that particular thing you can contribute, right? That particular thing that is so hard, uh, especially, by the way, in, in, in highly, uh, in, in spheres in which there is such a fine-tuned division of labor among people about what they do. And they do so little for the success of something. And to give them a sense that what they did was a serious contribution, a good, a good leader in that respect. If it's fake, it's the worst, right? So I'm talking about this, uh, this form of contribution, right? Nothing that endangers the independence of the child. The other way around. Because uh, if we want to make it more paradoxical, the gift has to be, to a certain degree, superfluous. Right? And its rejection makes you thoroughly superfluous. That's where I wanted to lead that. Tom. Right. 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 The interest in not being instrumentalized. Right. Third sense is, in some sense, the interest in the interest. Yeah. Being useful to the Right. Right. And it led me to think that, you know, when you're old, when you're marginal, what you're lacking is the inability to mutually use people, perhaps, in your capitalist story, not to participate in that sense in society as an equal. Right. Yeah. Well, f first, I mean, clearly there is a tension, right? So, so you cannot say a slave at least maintaining dignity by being useful. That would be horrible. Uh, so clearly there is a tension, right? And 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 you're right. Uh, but but there is a way in which we have to be careful with this idea of instrumentalization as a, as a kind of a almost reductive picture of loss of dignity. So you, you look at the elderly and good societies, right, as those who make their elderly genuinely feel useful. Uh, now, equality, I, I didn't talk about equality, and you're right. Uh, uh, clearly, we're talking about equality of the value of dignity per se. Right, so, so yeah, I mean, this is clearly the, the concept of human dignity, which is you have weight qua being human, not qua other any feature of you. But you have to ask yourself under, under uh, uh, harsh conditions of inequality, as, uh, that, of subordination and other things, how would we translate those into the, 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 the different categories, right? I mean, one way, by the way, uh, apropos inequality of power, and here is the, I believe something deep about the, the violation of dignity and the origins of violence, is that, is that the, when you don't have moral relation, the only way in which the other is not fully instrumentalized 
completely is by the fact that that other person has the power to inflict on you certain type of loss if it will be only instrumentalized. So you would say, look, it, it is a good thing. I mean, it is a basic thing in the matrix of social life that some sort of basic equality of, of, of uh, resources, some sort of minimal basic equality of resources will be there. So all those, all those forms of, of uh, crushing of agency, instrumentalization, making you superfluous, etc., will not be there. So it will be interesting. I, I, I didn't flesh it out. What will be a, a, an economic structure or an economic order uh, that in, which, in which weight is not going to be deprived of people. The weight that they deserve qua being humans. Yeah. Laura. Well, that's, that's a great question. So let's, let's get to the rabbi first. Uh, there is, it's actually a particular interest, a field of law that I'm interested in. There is a four volume response now, the rabbi who ended up in the Lower East Side, who wrote it in the Kovno ghetto, uh, called Shut Mima Makim, a response from the depth, you know, from the depth of misery. And I read it every ninth of Av. I made the point of going over you know, the, the, the mournful reading the response. And you're right. There is a way in which he restores dignity through the law. He says, you know, we are here. Uh, you know, there is a lot of, you know, clearly there are many things he allows under those horrible conditions. But you are a member of a legal community. And it's powerful in the sense of preserving that sliver of dignity into this condition. But there was something, I mean, I, it was so shocking to me when I read that other text, because I, I don't, I'm interested in moments in law. It's kind of moments of liminal situation in which you're not subject to the law. By the way, there are such moments. Uh, some of them in Jewish law refer to, to, to uh, to a state between, between death and burial. When you have a, uh, this is called an inut. It's, it's before morning starts, which is after burial. You have a, you have a, a moment in which uh, the person died, your relative. You have not yet buried him, and you are not under the law. It's actually, I remember when my father passed away, and. <coughs> And we didn't recite the Shema. We recite my, my brother and me every day because there is a, a liminal moment. Now, what is this idea of, of moments in which someone is not a subject of the law? Not because he abrogates or violates the law. Right? Now, I found that well, the power of the response I had to do with its brute honesty. I mean, there is a dignity in saying what it is. Right? Uh, you might say there is a dignity even in its protest against God. There is an element, we are not a covenantal people here. Right? It's a kind of, we are outside that realm. Might be restored, might not, but this is, this is not the conditions of, in which legal communities are supposed to operate. I mean, I'm not sure 
I, I saw it so, first of all, I, I was shocked to hear about it because, uh, and, and, but I can see the power of it. I can see even the dignity in actually declaring it for what it is. And like almost, uh, it, was the, it was the rabbinic analog, analog to Primo Levi. You know, it's kind of, uh, so I, 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 I would say that. Now, it comes to the other issue of, of uh, it comes to the other issue of preserving dignity and it's kind of a stoic way of retreating to the inner citadel of the self, which I don't, I mean, I admire, but I, I, I have ambivalence. Well, Martha has taught me a lot about these issues, right? As a reader of, of her work on, on Hellenistic ethics. One thing that you do, you know, there will be an inner citadel where what you think about your oppressor, yeah, he would never be able to take that from you, uh, etc. There is this kind of inner, preserving your inner dignity by retreating inwardly to, to the death of the soul. But that's, uh, uh, that's peeling from you more and more aspects of actual life in the way that sometimes I think of Stoicism as a preemptive death. Right? You say, well, you're not going to be attached to things you don't control. Right? Because then you'll be completely vacillating into the money depressive state of the world. And that, well, so then, but abnegating or preemptively cutting attachments is, is announcing yourself out of fear to a certain degree, dead before the thing happened. So I, 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 you know, clearly, you know, the heroism of people's capacity to, uh, and there is an argument that humiliation can never happen in a, in a kind of fully subjective view because there will be always a, an internal realm in which you can withdraw that would not be controlled by anyone. That's surrender. That's a surrender of the whole thing that actually you, you might say you deserve as a human being. So I am a, I'm, I, I'm ambivalent. I'm both, I admire, I would say, I am an ambivalent admirer of those inward practices. Clearly, when you're there, this is noble. So that's, so. I was going to ask something about control, but now you really have me caught up in this last question. So let me push back a little bit on that. I, I think you're being, uh, too easy on law, and certainly on the rabbi involved. And it feels like it has much more to do with time. Right. So let me just make a claim about that, and then I'll ask the question, and you could respond to either one. I mean, the startling response, you know, we don't really believe it, right? I mean, it's more of a metaphor. I mean, if the question had been not, uh, do I have to fast on Yom Kippur, but, uh, you know, I never liked the guy in the bed next to me, on the floor next to me, do you mind if I kill him? I mean, the rabbi would not have said, yeah, go for it. Law is completely suspended in your animal state. Good. I think what's being suspended there is any law related to time. You don't have to worry about the calendar or the holiday. It doesn't mean anything. And the same thing you notice with your example of the onane. And you're not, you, you can't go commit armed robbery before the funeral. You're only like, you know, sure. things related to time. Sure. You know, you don't have to worry about the time of the Shema. You can get away with not lighting candles. I mean, you can do things. So I think you're, you know, you're making it sound like all the laws at stake. Right. Yeah. That feels a little bit unfair. Okay. So let me just tie it to control, okay. and then you can comment on either one. I thought there was something really interesting. It's back to Professor Nussbaum's question. There's something really interesting about the examples you gave of the humiliation, which I think ring true for everybody. So I'm humiliated if the person, if my captor makes me strip or have sex or do this or be dirty or whatever. But what's interesting about those things is that there are a lot of other people who give up exactly those things of themselves in moments that to them seem sublime. Mm -hmm. You know, they join religious orders or they have love affairs and they do the very same things. They give up their clothes, they do this, they whip themselves. and so. There's something very interesting about the right. fact. Now, so it might just be, well, it all boils down to consent. Right. But in that case, we don't need the word dignity. We could use something else. Right. Well, so a few questions here. Uh, well, I, I think what he meant, and that's a good thing that you correct me. He didn't mean retrieving to a state of moral anarchism. 
you know, the precepts of natural law, etc., that have to be observed. He meant, I don't think only kind, positive laws. All, all sort of the, uh, the positivistic legal structure of, in this case, Jewish law, the other legal structures, other uh, fully robust legal traditions. It could be, by the way, laws that are not time bound. I can, if you want, I can do the, uh, you know, putting a zuza is not time bound, other things. Uh, uh, we, we are not under the law, under the law vis-a-vis -vis that, that, that covenantal sovereign relationship. doesn't mean that everything is allowed in this. I, I would absolutely agree with you. Right. Uh, so that's, uh, that, I, I stand corrected in, and clearly that's what I meant, clearly the Aninu. Uh, the the onen, that, that moment of liminality, uh, which is not uh, um, throwing away all restrictions towards others, but it is actually a deep declaration. It's, and it's not. It doesn't say, "Look, you don't have time." It doesn't come from the the realm of excuses and duress. That's what was interesting about this question, this answer. It was a kind of an exclusionary reason. It wasn't a reason. It was, look, this question is not relevant. It's not, I'm not going to address it within the legal known apparatus that I have. Uh, now, can people humiliate themselves? I, I'm sure they can. Yeah. Uh, is that, that will take us into a completely different line of thought, but I, I would say yes, right? uh, whether those examples are right or not. But yes, people humiliate themselves, though they consent them. And, and I would say sometimes you feel even worse when you see it, uh, especially uh, uh, through be acting in an undignified way, you know, craving something so much that you do things that are you know, you look at different, I mean, people who run for office or other things, you know. You would say, if they're going through that, this is a, a negative selection process. So whoever survived that, something wrong with you. And you humiliate yourself through that process. So I, 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 I don't think, I'm not, I have, I, I don't, I'm, since I have a lot of moral questions about the, the power, the, I would say, disproportionate power of consent in our moral world. I, I would stand by the fact that people definitely do humiliate themselves agreeing to do that. And it feels, looking at them, even worse than actually someone doing it to them. Uh, now, do we have a good phenomenon? Now, there are practices, there are practices that, that are communally meaningful that from someone who doesn't understand the, the web of symbols, etc., it will look humiliating and other things. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, to a certain degree, in, in the way artistic pra practices and pornography are, are so subtly uh, distinguished in our artistic world, right? I saw a Modigliani nude now being sold for, I, 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 got, I got her just now for, it. and then he was saying, well, this is not humiliating. This has to do with aesthetics and other things. In another, in another angle of it, so, so uh, yes, I, I would say the fun. so cultural practices, meanings, realms of meanings, I would, I would absolutely affirm the fact that people can humiliate themselves, and when they do it, it's, it feels even worse than actually being someone doing it. Okay, Alex, and then we'll take the other two questions over here. Yes. So I was wondering what the role of affect or feeling and the explanation of why is that to be in a state where you lost your dignity or on the state of reconciliation. So you know, one thing you mentioned in the talk was that uh, the dead can suffer a loss of dignity 
right, in virtue of having the wishes not respected or um, being rendered to capitalists. Uh, up to the dead don't feel anything. Uh, so that kind of makes it the fact that you can have your wishes not respected or uh, be treated as careful as without noting that fact or feeling anything at all. Um, so then, but in the case of, so what I'm curious about is in the case of people who are not dead. Uh, so um, in those sort of cases, um, is the kind of feeling of the loss of dignity something that plays have any role in the explanation of why it is that it's bad to be in that state? Or is it simply the situation that that's that yeah. feeling is responsive to that's really the, the feature that's bad, and that it also explains why it could be wrong to the people into that state? Okay, that's a great question. So, I here again is a is a larger kind of meta ethical question. Uh, part of my we would say uh, objection to utilitarianism in its crude form is the idea that all harms go through your mental experience. Uh, pleasure and pain. Uh, you can harm someone dramatically without that someone not feeling anything. Right? Someone can be betrayed by his friend. Uh, you can gossip and, 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 and talk and isolate someone from all of his other environment by everybody talking about him either nasty things or things that have nothing to do with him. He doesn't feel anything, he would not know anything, and he's dramatically hard. So I, I on the whole, and this will take us to a different question, I don't think that uh, uh, harm or, to that respect, achievement is measured through your inner state, must go through your inner state. This is why, you know, a person can be dramatically harmed if he is betrayed by the, the death promise that he gets that, that he gets from his fellow. He says, you know, promise me to take care of this, and then he dies. Well, now he doesn't feel anything. So I, 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 don't, I don't think that harm is reducible to inner states. But that will take us to, and, and I think we have many examples. I, I would say sometimes even it's related to the other problem. Sometimes even worse, right? Because you don't know, not feeling it, you, you don't know, you cannot face the reality in which you are trapped into without knowing. Uh, so this is just a general principle about the, 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 uh, the way in which we ought to separate harm from pain. I mean, clearly it's related as well, right? From the experience of pain or something. Uh, and this is why uh, humiliation could be felt and could not be felt. I think there was actually an interesting case uh, about older people being left. Uh, they were in a state of, of extreme form of dementia or Alzheimer's. And they were left by those who, by, by the people who treat them, you know, not clean, not, you know, in a horrible state. And they, you know, the defense was they don't feel it. Uh, and they were humiliated. Uh, so that's that's one thing. So it's it's independent of feeling, is my understanding, because I have a whole I can I will I will stake a larger defense, morally speaking, of the uh, separation between harm and pain or suffering or bad emotion. Uh, Clearly, I, I mean, now the question is, can someone feel that he's humiliated with actually not being humiliated, and would that be considered humiliation? This is very tricky and complicated situation. I mean, it could be, for example, in cross-cultural modes, where, where one signal, when you don't get the, the, the signal of weight is socially in my terminology, gravitas is also socially constructed. What, what it is to uh, violate someone's dignity, you can think that you have it that the other is made to feel. Here again, I'm not sure he's made to feel. There, there is a whole s a structure of, you might call it, sub, uh, uh, sub-subjective or, or common subjective communal experience of what does it mean to, uh, 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 to be with it. So I, I, I would say, uh, feeling humiliated is not either uh, uh, necessary or to a certain degree even sufficient condition for humiliation. 
Yeah, and then blue sweater, and then a big sweater after. So, Adam, just follows up on Brian's question uh, a little bit. I wonder whether it might be useful. The gift, to think the gift question. Sorry? The gift question? Yeah, the, yeah. the gift question. I wonder whether it might be useful to distinguish between violations of human dignity and violations of dignity. Because uh, if you think about some of the examples that you used, uh, you know, the son rejecting the gift of the father, or the student not respecting the wisdom of the teacher. These seems like these seem like violations of dignity, but not necessarily violations of human dignity. Right. So you might think my paternal dignity is violated, or my professorial dignity is violated. <laughs> there might be humiliations uh, too that uh, don't quite amount to violations of human dignity. There might be insults short of you know that, that don't quite qualify as violations of human dignity. So I wonder if you were to think of human dignity in particular, yeah. you might want to sort of specify your analysis. It might be certain kinds of humiliations that, yeah. that make the cut, you know, yeah. insulting one's status as an equal or something yeah. like that. It might be certain kinds of treating one as superfluous that make the cut. Yeah. So if I treat someone uh, as entirely superfluous, not just not superfluous as a father, but entirely superfluous, that would seem like a violation of human dignity. But it's not captured by the Good. example that you use. Good. So, so let's come back to the I, I think here in the Arabic, it's very interesting. Karam means dignity and generosity. So there is a, there is a relationship here. It's, it's actually very powerful. So you would say the following. Uh, you want the capacity to give, per se, to be a human independent feature. Being human is the capacity to give. Uh, so it's essential, it's constitutive to what, how do we imagine human life, not only how do we imagine the role of the teacher, the role of the father, etc. Et you, you might say, now I will cast it in terms of rights. Everybody ought to have the right to give. I think part of the, the, what's, what's so troubling, I mean, prison is a complex set of institutions. I mean, it has many things. It's a kind of a experience is putting people in a, criminals in a, in a kind of state of nature condition, right, of war, all, war of all against all. It's the most unregulated space, as long as it doesn't spill out. And it's a strange thing, prison, as a, as, a, as, a, as a human institution. But I think part of what's difficult about it is that people there are deprived of giving, even to their own children, even to the, they're only on the receiving end. And that's a very crushing effect. So I, your question pushes me uh, uh, towards the following observation, which is we want, we want the, we want the non-superfluousness of existence to be a feature not of a particular role we inhabit. Um, and and uh, that's, that's where we want to go in terms of violation of being, being, having impact or having weight is having the capacity to give something. Right? Now, you're right, my, my, my examples were role, role situated. But they, they, they aimed at capturing something that cuts deeper into our humanity for what we are. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question about uh, methodology, <laughs> kind of why you chose to approach it through a phenomenological lens. Um, but my, my first kind of confusion, I think, comes from the, the idea of, of uh, dignity doing different kinds of work. So there's this sense that dignity is a characteristic that can be enhanced or degraded. Right. And there's also, I think, a sense that we want to have about human dignity that it's a uh, quality that adheres, maybe like on an ontological level. Um, so in the sense uh, that you don't stop having ethical obligations to the people who are tortured and stripped of their clothes, that they haven't lost their dignity, even though we describe it at times in your talk as uh, there's been a loss of dignity, right? Uh, so I think those are kind of two separate, you might say that the person who is stripping the person or torturing them isn't respecting their dignity, but that's different than their dignity 
being lost or, or degraded. Yeah. But, so I think it's kind of doing two different sorts of work. And the first principle, I think the reason we care about the idea of dignity being degraded or enhanced depends on caring in the first place about dignity qua uh, humans, just human dignity, the, the kind of quality that inheres and can't really yeah. be altered. Um, and so my, I, I have a sense that that, that question uh, or that, that sense of dignity can't really be supported outside of a, a basically theological um, kind of justification. Mm. And I wondered if you did, phenomen you did phenomenological mm. analysis as a way to try to get us to a commitment to the first level of dignity as a, as a characteristic that adheres um, unconditionally uh, because it's a pluralistic world and we need human dignity to do work for our laws and so we can't just go around giving religious justifications. Um, but we can do this kind of phenomenology that kind of gets our moral intuitions on it. So um, this, is a, this is again a very complex question. Uh, I think that there, there is a way in which we deserve it. We, people are entitled to dignity qua being humans. The fact that they have dignity is more complicated, right? So sort of the ontological commitment is not, well, everybody has dignity qua being human. Everybody is entitled to dignity qua being human. Right. And this is why I think there are spectrum of violations and degradation, etc., etc. And some, some people, their dignity is violated. Right. People's uh, people dignity is violated in the different contexts. So this is why, if you want to talk about sort of my my ontological uh, uh, commitments, is not in a kind of uh, raw notion that people have dignity qua being humans. No, it's in the raw notion that people are entitled to dignity. They have a claim for dignity qua being human. And this is why it can be de they can be deprived of it. By saying that qua being human, people have dignity, you would say, well, then for you cannot deprive it from that. No, no, no. People qua have, uh, have dignity qua being human, they're entitled to dignity qua being human. Now, I, I didn't, and, and actually the, the first exchange that we had here with, with Martha, I didn't go to the question, uh, 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 trying to do the phenomenology, and I'm, uh, uh, and, and I, you know, methodologically, they always, the question always is, did it do some work? You know, whether it was philosophy, this, that, what. What I'm interested in is, did we explicate something? I didn't ask the question, which is a, a, another question which will lead us to different practices and, and, for example, end of life, other things, which is what's exactly the source of that entitlement? What is exactly the source of that entitlement? And then we will ask ourselves, uh, given that, we'll ask ourselves, what is the scope of that entitlement? Because if the source is Species oriented, you can, you can, you know, Martha will defend animals, you know, if they, let, uh, the dignity of animals is, is living fully an animal life, playfulness, space, light, don't, you know, other things that animals, etc. So it's a very important, the answer is that it's a very important question that I didn't touch. I don't have, uh, I, I'm not going to commit myself to defend the concept of dignity only on religious ground. No, that wasn't the purpose of my talk. I have, I, I have, a, I have, a, I think in the case of dignity, the religious language is rich and complex, and some of it can be translated, some of it cannot. But there are definitely a, a strong secular supports for, again, not the ontology of people having dignity, but the kind of almost deontological idea that people, qua humans, are entitled to dignity. Now what I did, I said, okay, we, the concept is complicated, let's examine what does it mean to violate human dignity. 
And that was the question we tried to address. But thanks for the question. Okay, is there anyone who's been waiting whom I haven't noticed? Oh, Derek, okay, that'll be the last question. Then we'll all have another 40 minutes to talk with Professor Halbert I'll have in the hall at the reception. Yeah, in some ways this question is just tying up some things and related to what I'm still struggling with this. this. So you, the examples you gave with, with the nakedness and the picture of Saddam were about being put to shame and suggesting that that was associated in some way, I don't know if it was an entailment or whatever, with the loss of dignity. Sure, it's an attempt to Right, and so I think, I think, so I think, I think that the, some of the questions on the floor have, at least for me, have been about whether one can be unsuccessful, yeah. right? And That's trying to put people to absolutely. shame, but be unsuccessful absolutely. at stripping them of their dignity. Absolutely. And you think the answer is yes to that? Yes. Yes. No. But, but yes, but it's a qualified yes. And I want to say something. Yeah. Clearly, there are some people, I mean, in different situations of concentration camps, of prisons, of, of torture, etc., that, that, that it's an unsuccessful attempt at, at degrading them. Right? It's a degrading behavior. Right? But, but you put people in conditions in which the crime, you put them on pride, and this is part of the exercise of torture. You put them in, in such radical pride of their sticking onto their own integrity. That, uh, that, that, that sometimes people will fail it and will come out of it in a sense of being crushed as human beings. Right? They have betrayed their principles. They have, uh, they, they have responded with ultimate fear of your next appearance, etc. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saying it because I hesitate uh, 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 I hesitate to the sort of answers that say, well, truly so, uh, humans at the end cannot be humiliated. Sort of ultimately, that's a kind of stoic. But no, no, there, there are social, social structural conditions of degrading people. It can fail in the sense that some people, by the way, it's, it's a rare achievement in those conditions. Some people will maintain uh, the capacity to stand fast, to persevere, uh, not, to, not to betray their friends, tell them <coughs> things about them, etc. But, but, uh, so I, I would agree that there, there could be failed attempts at degradations. I mean, that's, then I think it's going to be important to, to be mindful of the examples that you use, because I think that the torture and starvation example mm -hmm. is very different from the nudity example, right? Um, I mean, because this, this was this idea of shaming someone is different, I think, yeah. from getting them to submit, breaking their will, right, through torture, <laughs> through starvation. It's, it's you know, the, the practices that you see in different uh, cruel forms of treating prisoners of war, so let's say shaving, they're all shaved. Uh, and, uh, and basically what's, what's going on about is that you lost the power to present yourself to the world. You appear every morning, you get dressed, you fix your hair, you shave, you don't shave, it's, it's that sense of agency. I wouldn't, I wouldn't undermine clearly this, you might say, in these conditions, uh, uh, a certain form of, 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 rigid, of uh, inner strength is, is more easily achieved than under the stress of ongoing starvation. You're right. But I, 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 that, could break, that could break people, and it's done to, to break people. Right? It's done to... And what it's done is the, it's to undermine their very basic agency, I mean, which is so elemental, you know. A human, the human is the animal that gets rest. Right? It's a, another, another definition of humanity. Right? 
the dressing animal, the appearing animal. So I, you're right. I mean, the the, the will. This is easy. Seems to us easier to resist. By the way, there is a. If it's ongoing, there is a corrosive, complicated effect that it has, even on those who have the inner power to resist in the way they will speak, they'll stand up, they'll, they'll stay to whom they are, but there will be degrees of capacity to resist it. You know. Well, I want to urge us to come to the reception and discuss all this more, but thank you so much for this very... Good.